Hey everyone, it's Erica, and today I am here with my guest, Apollo. How are you? I'm doing good. How about yourself? Doing good. I am excited you are here to talk with us today about options. It seems like ever since small caps died, everyone is wanting to trade options now. <laughs> so um, it's a great opportunity to be able to talk with someone such as yourself who's you know, actually been trading options and is mm -hmm. comfortable in that environment. So the first thing I kind of want to start off with is our current market that we're saying we've been in a higher vol volatility <laughs> environment for a while. So how are you adjusting your approach right now? So uh, with the our current markets, they're very odd. We have a sort of this pairing between lack of liquidity mixed with volatility. So there can be a, a lot of imbalance. And so uh, I'm, I'm a little bit more hesitant to trade right now, but I'm still fulfilling the roles just being a net seller. What I like to do typically is I like to just keep short term credit spreads. I'll do those everywhere from just three DTE to zero DTE on, I typically just trade the Qs, the S and P, and then I'll do some of their um, ETPs as well. Okay. And so a lot of short term, a lot of volatile strategies, I'll short butterflies and uh, I'll try to work with some wider iron condors, but still a lot of it, a lot of it to me right now is that I just want to keep my books hedged. Um, outside of option trading, I'll be more aggressive for my covered calls, just trying to hedge those downside. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, fragility going on with uh, the upcoming Fed rates uh, going on in Ukraine right now. I think a great uh, opportunity is off the VIX itself. And that's one place that I've sort of been seeing myself trade more of. And you've been trading it on VIX itself or the UVIXI contract? I've been doing the UVIXI and the VXX. Okay. Um, actually uh, took a small loss on UVXY. So I'm going to let that one uh, go into the wash trade and uh, yeah. let that go to 30, 31 days and uh, play off the VXX a little bit. So when you're hedging with your covered call positions, are you finding that this higher volatility environment is giving you that extra premium to really reduce your cost basis? Yeah, it, it does. And so typically um, a normal covered call strategy is the short, the 30 Delta options. Um, now I'm more shorting the at the money ones more. Uh, I'll do those anywhere from two weeks all the way up to the monthly option expiration. Mm -hmm. and I'll just short the at the monies because i um, it really depends on uh, the asset as well. If it is one that's um, could see further downside, I'll typically short an at or an in the money call as well, just to hedge that actual uh, intrinsic value as well. Okay. And so, what is the um, advantage of choosing to sell an at the money covered call? Is that like what is your thinking behind um, choosing those strikes for those who aren't familiar with hedging <clears throat> positions? So the reason that I'm sort of targeting the, you know, when we're looking at uh, covered calls, that's that's a level one option strategy. That's something that's meant to just generate income. Uh, we typically do the 30 delta because it's a very low probability of it going there. But since we're in these high IV periods, your Vega exposure is highest at the money. And mm -hmm. so if I'm going to actually short um, short IV, I'm going to want to target those at the money. And so those are... And of course, we do have a lot of taking on a lot of the gamma pressure as well. But uh, when we want to see a market that's taking a lot of outflows, you know, it's uh, the spots, we're biased to the spots and IV also needs to come down as well. So mm -hmm. I also looked a lot to the IV term structure of the equities and the uh, overall market as well. And are there any um, like sectors or names that you're seeing any value in right now or it, or? you know, conversely, is there um, a sector that you're really concentrating on trading the short side on right now? So a lot of the long side right now is going to be more the gold side and more the financials. Energy has been on the board for a while. We've been seeing it uh, since November timeframe. But uh, this past week, we've seen a lot go to GDX, uh, GLD, GOLD, uh, the Vanguard ETFs. There's going to be a lot of these uh, I say it's just smart money. They're a lot of them positioning for Q2 and off the leaps mm -hmm. and uh, they'll probably integrate some long shorts, but that's uh, seems to where a lot of the smart money is positioning at and mm -hmm. um, makes sense with the current market we have. And are in, in these sectors, are you um, trading longer dated option strategies or are you, you know, are you using options to purchase the shares? Could you talk to us a little bit about how you're positioning yourself? 
So uh, my upfront approach is if I wanted to keep it simple, I, just, I work with a wheel strategy. I'll come in mm -hmm. and uh, leverage into puts and then mm -hmm. just sell off some uh, cover calls. Just want to kind of take okay. a holding there. Mm -hmm. If um, if I didn't necessarily have one highest capital allocation, I really target the puts or mm -hmm. not the puts, but the leaps. I'll okay. go long and at the money leap or uh, slightly in the money leap. And then I will use that to work off of like a poor man's cover call just to be a net seller of those contracts. Okay. And, and it's nice to do something like where you're selling the puts because of the premium is really reducing your cost basis on the underlying right now. Right. So, and, um, and I know that we also wanted to discuss how market makers or dealers, as they're referred to, um, are positioned and hedging their positions as well, which goes into a little bit about you, what you were talking about with your own portfolio. So uh, could you talk to us a little bit about how you are determining where they are positioned and kind of what you're what you're looking for to see what kind of hedging is being done? Because um, there's a lot of people that are really unfamiliar with how this process works. So that's a, uh, it's a very broad question. Um, I know you can take it one, <laughs> one point at a time. I'm sorry. So let's talk about, okay. So let's talk about whichever you want, uh, hedging or positioning first, whichever. So, um, uh, I've haven't used just the specific option chain in so long. I, before I really want to look into a position or want to even do anything first, I really want to see the option time and sales. I really target optionable assets. And so from the time and sales, I'm able to get a gauge on what strategies are being used. If I see uh, short straddles, uh, vertical, sp whatever that may be, uh, that can really give me a sense about who, what participants are in the options market right now. Do we have a lot of people who are just playing tell risk that want to play that jackpot side? Do we have people that want to, uh, they're playing more collars. They're looking for lower returns. You know, I really wanted to kind of get a gauge, a get a census. And the best way that I've seen doing that is through the option time and sales. And so uh, that's my first point. Uh, the second point from there is within defining my audience uh, of an of the market that I'm I'm participating in, whether that be like Apple, Microsoft, or uh, Bank of America, whatever that may be, I can sort of keep an ongoing tally about who has what position. So when I just look at OI, I can say, okay, I just saw a uh, short straddle. They uh, they sold 6,000 of them. And so I know who is, how much of that OI is short and how much that OI is long. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's no number that we can get that's going to be perfect to tell us which dealers are long, which dealers are short. Of course. But by understanding what the initial strategy was, we can see, okay, well, that's a uh, firm coming in, that's an institution, or this is more of our professional, or this is retail buying. But my target is to look for the hedged OI, and that hedge is initially looking at, okay, the dealer's going to take that on. Uh, if we're looking at uh, 30 Delta calls, for example, in the monthly, that's typically a range where people sell covered calls. So if I mm -hmm. see a lot of volume coming in, a lot of people that are sort of buying and selling those, I'll say, okay, that's more of a speculation area. If I see anything with like a Delta of 0 0.02, just deep out of the money, and a lot of those are being bought, you know, we can make the fair assumption to say that, okay, our dealers are majority net short there. It doesn't mm -hmm. make sense to really go short those calls. Right. And so we can predefine some, strategies to say, okay, our dealers would be uh, net short at these levels. Uh, they'd be net long. And so I sort of map it out based on the strategies and participants. That's my approach. And it's a okay. tad bit different, but that's how I get a consensus of an option chain. And so right. I try to keep an uh, active record uh, through Excel about the time and sales. <laughs> It's, uh, Which I feel like that's, is that a little bit difficult to manage all day long, especially with something like SPY, how many contracts are being traded each day? It like, definitely is, but I would rather have it than not mm -hmm. have it because well, I can yes, always do course. a look back. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, I say it's, it's more worth it than not because at the end of the day, uh, if I'm going to make a decision over the money that I steward, I want to be most informed that I can. Of course. And you, you're using this on Thinkorswim, right? Yes. Okay. Could you pull up uh, a screen share and show us what it looks like and what you Let's are see. looking for? Let's see. All right. Is it coming? Okay, sweet. Is this coming up? Yeah. So, uh, a general note, this is the, uh, this is spy. This is the one hour chart. And, um, this is what 
this is sort of how I trade off and off of. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really observe the market profiles. And so this is, uh, it roughly gives you a 3d view. Uh, have you, uh, messed with market profiles much? I have not. I am. Um, I'm one of those people who I really like clean charts. So <laughs> I haven't ventured into that yet. But it, uh, I, I, is this a custom script that you did? Or is it uh, one of the standard indicators they have? So this is a standard one. If you go to monkey bars, and then okay. set in your time interval, and mm -hmm. it'll set it up. And so okay. essentially, what's a um, a TPO is it's a it's a time price opportunity, and so if you take a um, take a one hour candle, right? So let's say the first hour trading, you know that's going to be a string of A's, right? Mm -hmm. And so the next hour, let's say from uh, ten o'clock to eleven o'clock, that'll be a string of B. Mm -hmm. And so when you merge candles together, it just makes one candle. But when you merge these TPOs together, you get this rough three D view of the market and the okay. auction process. So then we can really have a 3d view of you know where the fair value of an asset may be where a lot of your bids may come in where a lot of your ass may come in and then the more we take uh, we take this out on a longer time for time frame we can see where a lot of our long-term buyers will step in a lot of our long-term sellers will come in and when you are trading um spy for example are you also monitoring this same data on the futures contracts or on spx at the same time or are you just sticking to spy i typically work off of uh, spx i don't really look at the okay. futures as much mm -hmm. uh, i probably should <laughs> but uh it, when i'm trading the uh the spy i look for just short-term uh options mm -hmm. i will look uh probably around the vertical spreads i i do probably two to like i said three dte to zero dte mm -hmm. option uh i do credit spreads on those mm -hmm. and so i don't really go long a lot but uh if we are going for something that's you know we're expecting probably a two percent move in the s p i'll actually trade the underlying uh exchange trade products like uh your was it the u pro and the uh spxu Mm -hmm. And so the UPRO, have you done those leverage products much? Um, I have. I don't trade them particularly often because I find that like once I get comfortable sticking to my specific names, I usually like staying there. Um, one of like I don't necessarily trade contracts on SPY too much just because I'm one of those people who I really like the higher. So when we're in a higher IV environment, I do, mm -hmm. but if it's a lower volatility environment, then I'm usually going to the names that have that higher that higher beta to it, um, mm -hmm. just just because that fits more of my um, more of my trading style. But um, I know that the the leveraged products are a really great way to trade uh, market movement, market sentiment, um, without having to stick to spy or QQQ. So I know that there's a lot of options though when it comes to those. So this is one of my one of the main ones I play off of. I play off the U Pro, the uh, SPXU. Also play off the TQQ, U, mm -hmm. and the SQQQ, which is they're all triple leverages. So I know it's very risky, but right. I'll, when I want to play off that sort of one to two percent move, I'll come in here and I'll just uh, look for the thirty DTE contract and I'll go buy it at the money. And uh, uh, there's certain times where I'll just play the lottery as well if we're expecting a a sell-off like uh mm -hmm. we did going off of january but for these uh trading the s p there's so many products that you know we don't have to continuously search for you know what's what's a gamma squeeze coming up we don't have to search right. for a short squeeze but if you can effectively play off the s p you know you can play off the Qs, you can play off the fangs inside it like apple microsoft mm -hmm. you can also play off the vix you know there's a like probably 20 to 30 different option plays you can work off of just by really understanding the major indices. Of course. And you can really just stick to the indexes and the leverage products with them too. You don't have to be bouncing around looking for stocks each day. You can really stick to these. And when we're having a decent movement, like you said, um, there's plenty to capture there. That's the, uh, that's the fun of the market. Right. <laughs> So show us, okay, on the time and sales, um, you said, I know you mentioned you're looking to see um, 
things like you're looking to see the different types of strategies that are being opened or closed on the option time and sales? Because I know a lot mm-hmm. of people just aren't really familiar with it. So I want to make sure we cover that. So uh, I actually have a few examples over here just archived on uh, through Discord, but uh, I can just run through it right quick. So okay. this is for the SPY. And uh, if I wanted to go and filter through the option time and sales, this is going to load all the trades from the day. Mm-hmm. And um, for the SPY in particular, because there's so much volume, I'll just turn this up a tad mm-hmm. bit. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much volume being put through it, yeah. but all right. Here we go. Well, that, and if you're also seeing, you know, just a single contract being sold here and there, that's just not really telling you, like, that's not giving you enough information, right? On what it is that you're trying to see. Well, that, uh, that brings up a good point is that if I see some major trades, major sweeps coming through is I really try to locate where the origin of that is, because that can tell me sort of the original market. Uh, for example, a lot of, uh, these get sort of misquoted in a way because let's say that uh, we have the 452s right here and uh, we're seeing this, we can see that it's a sell side initially. Mm-hmm. And so we can also see that the bids or the ask step down in this process and all these get marked as, you know, buy to opens. But if, uh, if I turn this down to maybe the singles that get filled and it's just one giant order, except a lot of your big ones, they look at, uh, they look like buy to opens, it can be very misleading. And so that's where I really like to, if I see an order that uh, piques my interest, I'll come in there and look at a lot of the single prints. And mm-hmm. so I could see if, uh, if these are actual, you know, buys, or is it just one giant order that this is just the, the fill because IV got bumped up on the bid ask. Okay. And is that how you are spotting that unusual activity through the time and sales? So that's, uh, that's one component. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just like a normal person. I just come over here to my scan tab and, uh, I actually just do, uh, volume versus open interest and I'll play okay. around with these numbers a lot. Typically, uh, right out of the morning, I'll just start with around 10,000 just being max. And I'll try to figure out where a lot of the volume's going. I typically stay between the 14 days to expiration to 100. That just gives me a, a, a two, two to six week period a uh, little bit longer. And I'll do this for both calls and puts. Uh, typically I'll target between a 45 Delta, but I'll play around with these numbers throughout the day and it will, um, I'll do one real quick just for it to show an example. And so I, I just pops up volume versus OI and uh, I wish I had a better example. No, <laughs> I didn't no, really it's, it's, the it's good to much, show but... how, how it functions. Cause there's, um, there's so much that, you know, we, don't know how to do, especially me. I feel like I'm learning something new every single day with with (laughs) figuring out how to do. I I really need to need to stop trying to learn so many, um, but I can't help it. So (laughs) it's so fun. Yeah, it is. It is. It's uh, it's addicting for lack of a better word. So if I go to, so this is DNA. And mm-hmm. uh, I don't know if it's going to work out, but I can just simply, I saw right here, it says, okay, 7K volume versus 2,000 open interest, which would give me the idea of new contracts coming on. Mm-hmm. And so if I come over here to that, um, what was the contract? It was the March seven and a half calls. You said and you're so looking f- at DNA, right? D as in dog, N as in Nancy, A? Yes. Okay. That's so funny that you brought that one up because I recently traded that one. And from what I saw, which I was probably not trading it correctly, it looked like the options chain was just too illiquid for my taste. So I actually traded equities on it instead. So, um, but I guess you were saying a lot more than I did. Do you have like um, a minimum criteria of what you're trying to see to gauge the liquidity of an options chain? So, um, Yes and no. So if I'm just looking for a quick in and out, a short term trade, I'll target uh, something that's, uh, I try to get around less than 7% uh, ratio between the bid ask. So uh, let's see, I have this. Okay, so I can see my ratio bid. So that's basically if I was to buy the bid, you know, what because the bid ask is, is 10 cents wide. So, you know, what is the percent of the option that I'm really losing? It's for my payment to the market maker in a way. Right. And so I'll try to really get that less than seven, seven percent. That's sort of my threshold. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'll typically target a lot of the, uh, the indices themselves. But if I see, um, 
if I see where a lot of smart money's going, I see a lot of their giant call sweeps on the board. I won't necessarily care about liquidity as much because I'm more biased to getting that position and then being able to go long and short against that call or going long and short against that put. Okay. So I can reduce a lot of my, my sort of fee, my commission between uh, hedging that long short, uh, going long shares and going short shares against that option. Mm-hmm. And so for, okay, speaking of, of hedging, that's another thing that I wish was more widely known. Mm-hmm. What is, um, you know, like, I guess, in your opinion, what would be kind of like the initial beginner's way to hedge a position? Like, what would you recommend without having, I mean, we can go into advanced strategies after, but starting small when you're just trying to figure out what the heck it, does hedging mean and how do I do it? <laughs> like, what what would you recommend of starting that? So you're not sitting there with, you know, waiting <laughs> on these stocks to go back up. So uh, I look at, I look at hedging as sort of defining risk. Mm-hmm. And um, to any Anyone getting into the options world, I I, edu- or I encourage them to just get really educated. I really recommend sort of the level three. And so level three may say, oh, well, you're really jumping into it. But uh, a lot of my bread and butter early on was just vertical spreads. I would uh, I would do debit spreads and I'd do credit spreads. And that's all I did because I, uh, I had defined risk. I had um, I only put about, depends on what the play was, but you have a defined amount of your portfolio come in and then a debit, you know, a debit spread, your max loss is what that debit you would pay. And your credit would be that uh, premium you take minus your collateral. And so mm-hmm. every single trade you have defined risk. Yeah. And so that also helped from sort of the behavioral finance side where uh, if you, by capping off your upside or capping off your downside, uh, it can really help with, oh, do I sell now? Is this the top or is this the bottom shot buy in? You know, by defining your risk, you're really taking that emotional component off. And yeah. so uh, that's my sort of starting point with people. I agree. I think that um, trading simple vertical spreads is probably the one of the easiest ways to approach options trading. And like you said, you already have that predefined ric- risk of your max loss. And um, it gives you, you know, that that cushion. So you're learn, learning how to um, essentially trade both sides because a lot of people tend to have that um, bias, too, of only wanting to be long or only wanting to be short. So it kind of takes that out with that out of it as well. So um, I, I pulled GDX up right here. And so this is the uh, the Vanguard Gold Miners ETF. And mm-hmm. um I was posting this because we were, let's see if I can pull this up right quick. So I, I keep this archived in my discord and stuff, but I'll take screenshots of the time and sales, just keep like an active ledger. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, this is a vertical spread. It's a, uh, it's a call debit spread. They bought the 42s and sold the 45s against it. And so for seeing this, uh, one, it's a, uh, very big trade. It's a hundred thousand contracts. (laughs) <laughs> and so I don't know how many vertical spreads you've had at once, but I've had about a Not thousand before and trying to get them in there is very <laughs> tough. But uh, what I was mentioning earlier was about, you know, we follow GDX, we follow gold, we follow GLD. It's all these gold ETFs, um, even some underlying miners as well. Uh, and some, uh, some industrials, you'll track them. They'll all have the same trades on them. Now it won't be, it may not be to this size, but it'll be similar positions, whether they have a long biasness for June, whether they have these, uh, these debit spreads stacked throughout the chain. And so I'll, I'll observe this. And so I'll just try to get, you know, the current price ticker, uh, the major, uh, price that sticks out. And then I'll, here's another one as well. And so they also did the same thing for September. So there's another around 40,000 debit spreads purchased for September as well. And so positioning like this is very uh, atypical, if we would see that. And so uh, just by utilizing the option time and sales, you know, we've already seen a, a solid turnaround for this, what, 30, 32, 80 roughly, mm-hmm. um, the spot, you know, it's already had a five and a half percent. And so even if you're just swing trading shares, five and a half percent, that's 
that's great. <laughs> that's a great right. swing trade in the matter of a week. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I try to help a lot of people understand, you know, even if you don't want to trade options, that's fine. At least understand the market because it can point you to the direction about where money's going to go. Right. That, that's a that's a very good point because a, a lot of times we'll see the action happen in the options before it affects the underlying. Um, is there a certain a certain area in the chart or a certain time frame that you're looking at when you're opening your positions? Um, like, are you waiting for, um, say, like a, a an unsustainable move up in a in a stock and that's when you're opening a net selling position. Um, like kind of what, what are you looking for in that correlation to the underlying? So if I'm looking for, um, if I'm looking to do trades, I, I try to go find the ones that, uh, they're sort of the lower float or their options are very high for their actively traded float. And okay. so that typically correlates to like your options equal price action. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, Typically, you have a very illiquid uh, underlying. So we'll see a lot of these sort of almost gamma squeezes in a, pl in a way. But you'll see a lot of people just pile in Monday and Tuesday for the following week. It's very cheap options. But uh, you know Wednesday, you'll typically get major runners Tuesday and Wednesday off of that. And then uh, I typically look to go short uh, at the money or in the money calls uh, against them because <laughs> price, we observe this gamma pinning or this uh, max pain. Mm -hmm. And so I like to do a lot of uh, three DTE credit spreads. And mm -hmm. uh, I like to play that to uh, both the typically the downside, I'm typically bearish, because uh, when you have these sort of short rallies where a lot of people are buying these short dated options, a lot of your gamma flows are coming up. But mm -hmm. if there's no structure on your, uh, your next week, or even the monthly option expiration, mm -hmm. there's just no support. And so yeah. I really sort of play that risk, but more often than not, you'll have a hard sell off uh, Wednesday afternoon, Thursday and Friday. Mm -hmm. And um, when you're talking about gamma squeezes, I know everyone became familiar with that term, not necessarily what it means, but hearing it with uh, GME was, <laughs> was what really popularized <laughs> it recently. Um, so it, for the regular person, what, how are these uh, gamma squeezes identified? Like you said, people are piling in uh, Monday, Tuesday. Like how, um, how are you seeing that? Is that through the options time and sales as well? Yeah. So uh, when we are really trying to identify candidates for a gamma squeeze, uh, sort of like I mentioned earlier where we need a lot of option, we need a lot of open interest uh versus the active float. And so if you have a, a low float, but uh, a ton of OI that's on, I know BBIG is a, a few weeks ago going off the January option expiration, you had half the float tied up in that one expiration, mm -hmm. half the float in options. And that mm -hmm. is, um, that's crazy to even think about. But uh, when you have a, um, a biasness where a lot of retailers sort of speculating coming down the market, uh, Typically, your market your market maker is going to underwrite a lot of those contracts, meaning they are going to have to buy a lot of the uh, shares underlying, and they're going to, have to uh, actively trade those. And so, you're really forcing the dealer to buy and sell. Mm -hmm. And so, if you have a large inflow of uh, these short term option traders, that's uh, you know they're speculating, they're buying out the money calls. That's just forcing the dealer to go buy new delta. Mm -hmm. And so it's just going to keep on driving price up. And then you create this sort of gamma loop because, you know, gamma is uh, the change in delta with respect to spot price. And so gamma is the highest at the money. And gamma is also the highest with uh, the shorter uh, days to expiration. And so it's kind of like you have this this curve that's flattened out. And as time expires, you you pull, you pull it up and it just keeps on growing at the money. And so... Right where this gets really dangerous for these gamma squeezes is where you have a lot of participants buying a lot of these deep out of the money calls. And whenever those get forced at the money for where they had a, like a Delta of like 0 0.02 or 0 0.05. And now they're having to have a Delta of like 20 or 30 that changes everything to where your dealers just keep on buying and keep on buying. Mm -hmm. And does that, um, do you see a difference in a positive versus neg negative gamma environment with the 
uh, squeezes and how it affects. Because I know, obviously, the environment affects how the underlying moves. I mean, not all the time because there's always exceptions, but uh, typically how it moves in either environment. So do you want to see more of negative gamma clearing? Do you want it to be more in a positive environment? So um, the aspect of negative gamma is where your your market maker, they're buying into buy pressure and they're selling into sell pressure. So I'm very biased to keep in that negative gamma environment, but I also, there's a, point about time and sales that comes in that as well is because you know you need to keep the gamma pressure up and so when you have these large 100 percent moves 200 percent moves they're very atypical but mm -hmm. a lot of people uh after you have those runs you know you want to keep the gamma pressure up and you keep price going but everyone sort of okay let's go buy the deepest out of the money contract and let's do it again but if there's no at the money pressure the law of gravity comes in and price just goes down right which those additional calls out of the money and now the puts start going in which causes huge selling pressure mm -hmm. and so i observe the time in sales because when there's that lack of at the money buy pressure coming in that sort of tells you when the music's stopping on these gamma squeezes mm -hmm. and so that's a great time to out in those scenarios i'll typically uh, short a call credit spread and then i would enter in a put debit spread around a one to two ratio so i'll do one call credit spread and two put debit spreads very heavily biased trades but uh i have defined risk in that trade and then i also um, am hedging to where i'm not really as affected with theta and as affected with uh iv right and once you're seeing that um that pressure really start to to fade it's harder for it to regain right like once once the the out of the money calls are being pushed further and further out of the money mm -hmm. it seems like it, it's getting a it's a harder uphill battle to climb yep that is correct and um it's sort of the big issue that came out of last january with uh, a lot of the memes although they did remove the buy button it didn't a lot of what stopped them is because the options they quit buying options they could have kept it going the following week they had the positions there but um it's they did it but they did i guess they didn't know how they did it and uh yeah. of course they were able to do it they've done it several times since then but mm -hmm. that's why i'm really trying to help um a lot of retail traders try to understand the options market the power they have i think uh on average around 20 percent of retail uh, or 20 percent of the options market is retail Mm -hmm. compared to was I think around 9% in the equities market. So they with leveraged products, you know, you're getting more bang for your buck essentially. And right. if they learn how to use that correctly, they could definitely um, really keep their portfolios green, uh, really learn how to read stuff on the market. It's just a huge edge in my opinion. Right. I mean, I would say though that, I mean, if you let me know if you agree with me, though, that um, typically we do see the options market more favored to the seller. That right? is correct. OK, mm -hmm. so when someone is especially be beginning, I, I, I agree with you completely that it's important for them to learn, um, especially with how to hedge their investments and understand um, the different products that affect the equities. But would you say that there is... Um, a certain, like, is, do you think someone should really jump into trading, trying to learn options at the same time? Or it, do you think it's helpful to kind of have that basis of understanding trade strategy, um, position sizing, things like that before adding on options trading? I do think that there needs to be a uh... Uh, education before even touching options. I definitely recommend trying to, you know, learn risk profiles, learn uh, position sizing, learn that uh, portfolio management. You know, yeah. if you can't, well, managing long short positions, that's, that's tough to begin with. And then you're adding uh, derivatives, <laughs> all this <laughs> yeah. uh, calculus, all this stuff. It just gets really complex. And there's very few people that's really, I won't really master the derivative market because it's just really complex. A lot of people just don't even touch it because it's just complex by nature. Mm -hmm. So, um, and another thing is that within the derivative market, that's taken thousands of hours to really become fluent in. It's not something that you're going to get overnight. And so a lot right. of people in trading, they look for the short-term profits and uh, within options, they can 
get very frustrated because it's going to take hundreds of hours to understand this thing. Mm -hmm. Well, that and then you, you know, you jump into options trading and, you know, get lucky and your (laughs) one, your single contract goes, you know, 900 percent. And you're like, that's it. I'm done. I'll trade nothing. (laughs) And a hundred percent on the next trade. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Um, Are there any um, educational resources or websites that you would recommend for trying to learn options? So uh, I definitely recommend Tasty Trade. Uh, If you go on YouTube, look up Mike and his whiteboard. He did an amazing series. Outside of that, they do provide some additional resources about uh, different strategies. Uh, them and project option they did an amazing job as well so those are the main two that i'll uh, recommend early on uh Mm -hmm. outside of that if you're working more to the intermediate to advanced side i would recommend going to squeeze metrics spot gamma uh understanding their resources and materials they provide okay and you said you have a a discord group too if you want to go ahead and and plug that do you go over education as well or is it just more like kind of trade ideas and understanding where your own perspective is so uh, I do host a Discord of my own. I uh, I do uh, premium uh, service there with the limited free side. And what I really hone in on is more of the advanced side between how market makers are hedging on the markets, mm-hmm. uh, really digging into you know firm positioning, the unusual activity, uh, even look into these sort of potential gamma squeezes coming together, understand what needs to be hedged, the uh Delta decay, uh, you know, Delta decay with IV, IV expansion, understanding all these different environments together. And I just want to provide a educational platform to the intermediate and advanced players that are looking to kick their game up in a way. And although uh, we can make returns with uh, level one, level two strategies on the market, uh, this is more for the person wanting to take the next step and saying, okay, I've, I've got that. Mm-hmm. Let's, uh, let's, try this let's uh take it to advance let's do like let's see what the market makers are doing Mm -hmm. see what the dealers are doing i think that's really cool to map through the sort of implied order book Mm -hmm. squeeze metrics did a series over that and it's sort of predefining a market and that's what i really dig into is like what is the option market projecting on price what Mm -hmm. is their thoughts so uh it's like options give you this uh this sort of like treasure map or this roadmap to price before price even gets there because you know the s p it already has a predefined market at uh five thousand even though price hasn't even hit there and so mm-hmm. understanding what price is going to do at those future resistance levels or those future support levels i think that's a huge edge and speaking of of which actually um I'd love to get your take on this as well, because I know it was just a few weeks ago, I think, for the uh, monthly expirations, which are now expiring this week, um, for SPY, it seemed like there was a lot of um, dealers that were positioned um, net short, but with a very heavy OI at the 460 strike. And it Mm -hmm. seemed like there was going to be this environment of trapping all these retail <laughs> shorts that piled in with the mm-hmm. with the really overpriced contracts and then we see these um exogenous events such as the Russia Ukraine situation <laughs> and it seemed like that just kind of put that <laughs> like completely killed <laughs> that like mm-hmm. uh is it just kind of a case of these outside factors coming in or did you kind of see it falling to its death <laughs> before i i I definitely, I don't see a hard bull rally. There's a oh, lot no, of no, no, definitely not a hard bull ra- rally. I mean, <laughs> to four, six, I mean, you mean. short, short uh, term. Cause we saw <laughs> there was a lot of positioning at that, um, at that area. And I think we were still in a negative gamma environment. So it was like, if we mm-hmm. could push to that level, but it just sort of fell apart. Yeah. So, uh um, the, there's many components of the spy that you can't just look at the spy and it's uh it's option chain. I think a lot of people uh, just try to it's like okay, that's the only thing I need to look at because we also need to look at the uh, SPX. We also need to look at uh, the underlying equities. You know, what does Apple's option chain look like? Microsoft, Facebook, Tesla. You know, are they in support of that move as well? You know, what is the VIX? Uh, what is the VIX uh, option chain look like? And so. Um, <laughs> when you have events like Ukraine, uh, Russia coming on the board with NATO, like that's a big event that will affect the S and P. Yeah. And so you're not, if there's concerns about war going on, you're not going to have this 
five percent move. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And so yeah. And there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, sometimes it just happens. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so in that case, it's you have a it's the same side of coin where uh, if you have a lot of people buying that call, it doesn't mean price is going to go to that call. Mm -hmm. You know, there's two sides to every coin. If you have a lot of retail that are buying those calls, what does that tell you? Well, uh, majority of the time, retail don't statically hedge against their options. And what that means is, is that uh, they're not offsetting the gamma exposure, meaning mm -hmm. the dealers are carrying all the footprint on price compared to the other people in the OI. So if I say that where your dealers are buying into buy pressure and they're selling into sell pressure, if the retail are not going long and short against that option, they're not offsetting that sell pressure. They're not offsetting that buy pressure. Mm -hmm. And that's where you'll have a lot of volatility come in where these other strikes are offering negative exposure. And um, more times than not, the law of gravity works. <laughs> <laughs> good point. Good point. So thank you so much for coming on and, and speaking with me. This was uh, an enlightening interview. Um, I'm always so curious to hear, uh, to learn more about options trading. And I've been diving in deep to the uh, gamma environments. So <laughs> down, <Sweet>. down the <laughs> rabbit hole. Um, th but yeah, thank you so much for coming on and, and speaking with me. And um, I would love to have you back sometime if you want to come. Sweet. Well, uh, I appreciate you hosting me and uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. Want more Trader Babes? Subscribe now and connect with us on social media for exclusive content and access you won't find anywhere else. And we'll see you right here on the next unforgettable episode of Trader Babes.